Cool. Morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, I am Matt Turner. I'm a software engineer at uh, Tetrate. We do enterprise level service mesh stuff. So if anybody is, is you know, running this in production, and wants some help with, uh, you know, high compliance, high assurance kind of stuff, then come have a chat. Um, I'm going to be taking us through kind of how, how a service mesh works, Istio in particular. I will touch on a couple of the others and how they differ. Um, this talk was originally sort of an explainer talk, more of a, oh, you, you're using this or you want to use this. How does it work? Let's give you a mental model for what's going on. Um, I, I'm on the security track today, so I will, I will still do that, but I'll try to focus a little more on the security side of things as they come up. Um, I'm also going to try to fit this in 25 minutes and leave some space for questions, but it's, it's going to be a bit tight, so let's see how we do. Um, okay, so why are we even talking about this at all? I'll, uh, I'll rush through this, but the sort of history is that you you know, have you went to microservices, right? You maybe had some issues with, you know, what used to be, you know, monoliths have some issues, but if class A calls class B, that's essentially instant and it never fails. And class A always knows where class B is, right? So there were some things they did quite well. So when we split into microservices, we lost a lot of those guarantees. So we ended up either ignoring them and having failures or sort of hand cranking some code to, to get over them. Very quickly, we started using libraries, so we didn't have to write that code. Uh, Hystrix and Finnegal are sort of two of the common libraries that, that we might have included. We took that then out of process, and we said, well, you know, what, is, what are these libraries doing? They're doing uh, service discovery for us. They're doing back-offs. They're doing retries. They're maybe enforcing some policy. Do we have some code that already does that? Well, yeah, we do. It's an, actually an HTTP proxy, maybe an Nginx or Apache or HA proxy or something. So we can use that sort of out of process and run it alongside our workloads. And then we very quickly found that if we have 10,000 microservices, we have 10,000 proxies to configure, and that's very tedious, especially if you're doing it with Ansible or SSH or something, right? Uh, so we ended up with a control plane that could configure these things, um, sending them config, sending them various other things that I'll touch on. And then we found that that control plane itself probably needed an API so we could talk to it. Uh, and that API needs to be ergonomic to the people that are going to use this system, uh, to the developers who want to take back control, <laughs> if you'll excuse the phrase, of their apps, um, and of the sort of security folks uh, who are looking to, to enforce and add security on the network. So this is called Life of a Packet 3, um, because I did do Life of a Packet 1. Is back in sort of 2017. That was an explainer of how Istio worked back in the like 0.2 days. Um, so life of the packet two, there was COVID. I don't know, didn't happen. Um, this probably would have happened in response. So there were a couple of major architectural changes in Istio that probably would have prompted this, uh, but we were all busy. Um, so this one is now bang up to date with uh, the sort of latest developments. Uh, includes all the buzzwords that you probably want to hear about, like eBPF and Wasm and Ambient Mesh. So let's go through and uh, we'll do the, the sort of explainer as to how this system works and we'll touch on some of the newer features as they come up and then they'll, uh, at the end I'll, I'll talk about some of the later developments as well. Okay, so very uh, seemingly simple you know, request from a user, right? Sat out on the internet with a phone or a browser or something and they want to do a get. They want to do HTTP get. This is going to be for uh, a secure website, and it's, you know, it's got a DNS name where we can discover it, and we, we want to get um, a, you know, a, a sub-resource, right? We want to get a, a path. So first of all, we've got to ingress. Let's assume I've got a load of slides that are hidden because we've got 25 minutes, but we've done, you know, we've traversed the internet, we've done all the DNS, we found the CDN or whatever, and we found this is a Kubernetes cluster, right? We found our Kubernetes cluster. So the first thing our, our packet needs to do, um, and nobody spotted my Star Trek 3 jug yet, I don't think, or if they, they have, they haven't laughed. Um, the first thing our little packet, at least used to be in Yancat, because that was 2017's meme. Um, the first thing our packet is going to do is hit uh, like an ingress controller. So if you've used Kubernetes, you might be using the Nginx ingress or the HA proxy ingress or one of the products like Emissary or something. Uh, so it's going to hit this. It's going to hit this ingress layer, and this is you can think of this kind of like a uh, maybe a normal Kubernetes ingress controller. But already, okay, first buzzword. Already, um, at this ingress layer, well, somewhere between the end user and your application, you're going to want a bunch of features 
uh, the broadly common come under the term of an API gateway. Right? So this ingress, just like an Nginx ingress, is going to do host and path-based routing. So we've got that slash orders on the end, and we're going to find, like spoiler alert, we're going to find the orders service. But we probably also want you know, JWT auth of the users. We maybe want some weight limiting. We want bot blocking. We want you know, request body schema validation. We want uh, WAF features, you know, sophisticated stuff that's going to try to block injection attacks and, uh, and take care of cores and stuff for us. So this is, these systems are often packaged and sold to you for quite a lot of money, and they often run as a separate layer, you know, who's, who's got a traditional system with maybe like a, a, like a load balancer, like a layer three load balancer, you know, an F5 or something, and then you get to the, the firewall, and then you hit the WAF, and then you maybe hit an Apache that actually does your sort of service discovery and, and path routing. Uh, with the newer systems, with the Envoy proxy that we're using, we can consolidate a lot of that functionality into one place. So Envoy is extensible at runtime. We can compile uh, arbitrary code to, to WASM, and we can inject it into Envoy. So we can actually make this ingress layer quite sophisticated uh, and add a lot of those features. And there's an um, a open source project out there called Caraza, which is uh, like a Golang re-implementation of, of mod security for Apache. So it, it reads the same mod security style rules, and it can, inv it can do all of the WAF stuff that the mod security could do. OK, so assuming we've, you know, we've, we've got our sort of edge protection, we now want to call you know, that, that order service. So where are we going? You know, ingress is, is common to all requests, but now we want to go and find uh, the service that we want to hit. So this is where our control plane comes in. Uh, and our Istio's control plane actually used to be several microservices. Um, Life of a Packet 2, if it existed, would have been about how that was consolidated, actually. They, it's a really interesting blog post. If anybody wants to read it, they kind of backed off from microservices uh, into one sort of monolithic control piece uh, for various reasons. So we have Istio D, um, logically a you know, single control plane, actually also physically a single piece of code now as well. Uh, and this thing, as you probably saw before, you know, it's the thing that's going to send config to uh, all of the Envoy proxies that we're using, so all of these on the ingress, and then all of them in the middle that, that form the service mesh. Uh, and Envoy was designed, the reason it, the system uses Envoy, and they did look at HA proxy and Nginx and all those other things, the reason the system uses them, one of the reasons it uses Envoy was that it was designed you know, from the ground up to be a modern, API-driven thing. So you don't configure this thing with files on disk you know, and send it sig hop. Uh, it's got an API uh, that uh, it'll accept config over. And actually, a lot of work was done to standardize this and open the specification for this API. They called it the, the data plane API. Uh, so that actually Envoy you know, could, doesn't lock you in, and so Envoy can be replaced by, by another proxy should they choose to implement it as well. But anyway, open standard for this API so you can replace, theoretically replace uh, either the control plane or this, or this data plane. Where does this get its config from? So we said that you know, that control plane itself is going to need an API, which we as users uh, interact with. Well, that's not a network API in this case, right? It's not a port listening for like JSON over HTTP. It's actually a Kubernetes API. So you feed as a user, you kubectl apply, you feed uh, CRDs, Kubernetes resources into, into the Kubernetes system. Um, it gets stored in the Kubernetes database, and then Istio, it's, it's just an operator like any other operator, if you're familiar with that pattern, and it can, re can read those resources out, and that's, that's Istio's API. The other thing it needs to know, because we're saying, well, we're trying to route this packet, right? Like, we know we're going to want to go to slash orders. Where is that? So it actually needs to know what, is, what services are running in Kubernetes. So it can read that from, I've got this little arrow here from Kubernetes coming sort of roughly from the Kubernetes system. So it can, it's essentially doing service discovery for us, right? It needs to, I've got slash orders, what does that mean? Well, it's got some, okay, virtual service, like the orders service. What does the orders service actually mean? I've got to send it somewhere at the end of the day. So it can read service discovery information from Kubernetes, and also it can actually plug into console, Zookeeper, several other systems as well. So this Istio D is going to gather the information about all of these services. So anything running in Kubernetes, it'll just get from Kubernetes. Uh, things running outside, because the mesh doesn't have to be limited to a cube cluster, it can read from these other service discovery mechanisms. So what's it reading from cube? Well, the naive answer might be, you know, services. I, could, I can get my services, and I can see each one has 
you know, well, I've got service A here, right? It's got a cluster IP. Uh, and this is what you would normally use. So this is exposed, and you can read it from the Kubernetes API. It's also exposed over DNS. Now, in any pod, I can look up that DNS name, and I'll get the IP of that service. That's not actually what we want in this case, because those Kubernetes services are, are load balancers, right? They're virtual IPs. So they're um, sort of layer three load balancers within Kubernetes. Uh, and actually, Istio wants to do direct communication from service to service, and it, it, because it wants to do its own load balancing. Because, because we've got the proxies running at layer seven, we can do much more sophisticated load balancing than this sort of layer three scattergun kind of approach. So we actually don't want to read this. What we've got is another Kubernetes resource called endpoints. So if I read the endpoints for service A, I get a list of IPs, and you might notice they're in a different subnet. These are the direct IPs of the pods that form that service. So Istio wants to read these, and it can then do direct workload to workload communication, and it can take care of the load balancing. So the, this is how it does service discovery. And I can, I can go get the details of, of one of these endpoints, and we get some really useful stuff like um, which node it's on, and then I can go look that up in the node API in Kubernetes, and I can find out where this is, which cloud provider region and availability zone it is, so we can then start doing clever stuff like locale-based routing. You know, I know I want to reach service A, which is the physically closest service A? Like, if they're all up, if there's no other way to differentiate them, which one is going to be lower latency, right? Which one is on my host, maybe, in my availability zone, rather than somewhere in the wider region? So it can get quite sophisticated. OK, so um, Istio D brings in a whole load of information, so a combination of all of these service discovery sources and then the extra configuration that, that you've given it through its custom resources, through its API. And we now know which, uh, we know that slash orders translates to service A, uh, and we know where that is. We know the IPs of those pods. So our, our packet can go that way. But what does it actually hit? And this is maybe where we can start talking about security a little bit. I'm already thinking I might have to speed up. Um, so what is a container? I won't get too philosophical because we don't have time. But it's not, it's not a thing. You won't find container with a capital C in the Linux kernel code, right? It's a sort of higher level construct invented by the likes of LXC and, and Docker. A container in the kernel is a set of these software isolation boundaries, a set of namespaces. Um, so you might have you know, an Nginx container running, like engine, so the blue box is a Linux process. So we might be running Nginx, the process, and then say a supervisor D alongside it in the container. And these are namespace. These are in a mount namespace, which is like a chiroot. Um, because we're running from a container image, right? So we're essentially chirruting into that container image. A mount namespace isolates the file system just to that container image. That's the new way of doing it. And we also isolate, so PID is, you know, if you've ever had a shell in a container and don't run PS, you can only see the processes in your container, right? Not in other containers, not on the host. That's because the PID namespace isolates process IDs and the process IDs that you can see. Um, user isolates user IDs so that user ID 1000 in one container isn't actually considered the same as user 1000 in another container. This stops all your sort of old school, let me map some memory pages kind of attacks. Uh, UTS is the one that isolates the time and time zone, I think. Um, Host name, sorry, host name. That's why the containers have their own host name. Um, IPC stops you doing sort of System 5 IPC between these things. I mean, you know, why would you? It's, it's 2023, except it's quite a good attack vector sometimes. It, that also stops you signaling things. And then net, the network namespace, I select a bunch of network-related stuff that I'll come on to. A um, little bit of embarrassing fan service, I think, the next slide is, if you want to learn about containers, there's this awesome lady called Liz Rice, who does, no, honest, genuinely fantastic talk uh, and repo about we're building these containers from scratch, so writing 100, 150 lines of Golang, right? Which makes the system calls to set these up uh, and really takes you through it. So if you do want to learn about containers, um, somebody called Liz Rice has done, a, has done a great talk, and that's a link to it. Uh, sorry, Liz. <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to be here. Um, oh, sorry. You can just go talk to Liz after. You don't need, you don't need a QR code now. <laughs> I fear Liz as well. <laughs> so what's a Kubernetes pod? Because our request is hitting a pod. So a pod kind of looks like this. It's sort of like a super container. So it's, it's two containers 
that share a bunch of namespaces. So they, they have to have their own mount namespaces because we're routing into two separate container images. They usually sometimes have their own PID namespace, um, but they share a UTS namespace, so they share a host name. They share the user IDs, so that a user ID that, you know, if a file's owned, if Nginx has a, a file owned by user 1000, you know, FluentD can get permissions to read that. They can, you know, IPC each other, signal each other, and they share the same network namespace, which is something important that we'll come on to. Uh, as of Kubernetes 1.8, you can opt into them sharing the same PID namespace. Reasons won't go into why you may or may not want to do that. But what's in this network namespace? Well, it's, it's the software bits of networking. So like visibility of the PCI device, of the network card, isn't actually covered by this. That would be C groups, which is the other thing that makes up a container. They're the like hardware isolation of how many CPU cycles can I use, how much memory can I use, which devices on the PCI bus can I see. I haven't really shown them here because they're not too relevant, but they're like the orthogonal other part of a container. But the software aspects of networking, so you know, interfaces, you know, ETH0 is, is going to probably, well, let's pretend this is backed by a PCI card. Um, but loopback, right, is just a figment of software imagination. There's no hardware under a loopback device, so that's a software thing. And every container gets its own, what you, when you uh, run if config, um, IP link show in a container, and you see loopback, it is not the same loopback as on the host uh, or in a different container. It also isolates, you know, your sockets you've got open, uh, a root table, so this can differ container to container, pod to pod, and it isolates IP tables rules as well. So say we've got Nginx here listening on, on 8080 TCP, you know, bound to, to this E0. Well, I can go set up some very aggressive IP tables rules that just do a blanket intercept of everything. And I can redirect any traffic that's coming in for 8080 TCP. I can redirect it into Envoy for technical reasons back out actually to, to the loopback and then off the loopback into Nginx. And I can use some very aggressive IP, sort of catch all IP tables rules to do that for security, um, to make sure we intercept all the traffic, we force everything through the proxy, and they only affect this pod. Uh, I will not spend much time on this, but it gets complicated, right? This is the route that things take uh, from the host, this is the route that things take into a container, through the Envoy and into an app. Um, if you want to look at the IP chains that it uses, it gets even more complicated. Uh, and then this is on the way out, same but different, different IP chains, different routes. Next buzzword, BPF. No, BPF is great. We love BPF. Uh, your CNI, which is not shown, probably uses BPF to do some or a lot of its own thing. And then within the pod, we can use BPF for acceleration as well. So what we used to have was something coming out of Envoy into the app. You know, these are in the same network namespace. They've got to go all the way through the socket layer into all the way to a fake, what's ultimately a fake network interface, right? I mean, they get put in TCP packets, they get put in Ethernet frames, they get put into a ring buffer, I guess, into something completely fake, and then they come back up through all the decap on the other side. Very slow, involves a context switch into the kernel, completely pointless, so we can use BPF to just bypass that. That's kind of all Istio does on its own. For more BPF acceleration, then you're talking about the sort of host Kubernetes level networking, which would be here, and that would be you know, where your choice of CNI uh, matters, and obviously Cilium uses a lot of BPF. But it is sort of complementary to this. So if you've got two pods on one host, it can get even better, because I can put BPF in here, and I can also do BPF there. And this is a, you know, this is a newer addition, this is an optimization, so this has come in since I first did this talk about Istio 0.1, right? But this is fairly heavily used now. So, oh, I'm going to have to speed up. Um, but again, it's security related, so I think I'll cover it. That Envoy sidecar, how does that end up in our pod? Because as a dev, we want a good dev experience. We want this to be transparent, and it is. So as a dev, I can submit a, you know, a pod spec to Kubernetes that only lists my container with my app in. And I get that sidecar for free. It comes up transparently, so I don't have to know about it. I have a good dev experience, but I get all the benefits of having the sidecar. So how does that happen? Um, I'm going to assume we're all fairly familiar with Kube, so uh, Istio registers a mutating webhook admission controller, changes the definition of the pod to include a couple of things. So first of all, so when the pod is built, again, go see Liz's talk, when the pod is built, you know, during that process, we, we start to build a load of these namespaces. 
And then within this sort of, so namespaces are sort of persistent, right? So we build these namespaces, and within these namespaces, we run an init container. So we run this, this kind of run to completion container image called Istio init. Um, and one of the things it does is runs a very long shell script that basically installs all of those IP tables rules, right? Those really aggressive intercept everything IP tables rules. Then it runs to completion and it dies and it goes away. And then the two containers that run at runtime are Nginx and then the, the, the proxy, the Envoy proxy. Um, so this is what I submitted, the YAML containing my app. This is what was injected by the sidecar admission controller. When these run, the IP tables rules are already in place, right? They persist because they live within this namespace and we didn't tear that down. So the, they won't persist across reboots. You know, you need to save and restore, but that's, this, this is the cloud. Those things are already there when these images come up because they were put in place by this init container. So another interesting little fact is this init container, run, you need some, some privileges to install IP tables rules. You need cap net admin. I think there's maybe a cap IP tables these days. Um, but you need some kind of limit, uh, like Unix capability uh, on the way to root. So the init container can have that. It runs to completion, and then neither of the things at runtime needs any of those capabilities, it has the ability to manipulate IP tables rules, so they can't be coerced into doing it. Okay, real fast with the rest of it. So we're going to, okay, now say we've called into service A, back out again through the proxy, we've discovered service B, we want to call across to service B. Simple, right? And as I say, remember, we can do direct proxy to proxy calls, and we can do a bunch of clever load balancing and stuff while we're at it, uh, because we know the IPs of these things. We don't have to go through this, those uh, fairly dumb Kubernetes services. Telemetry. First thing we might want to do is observe this traffic. Um, I you know, would say that this is actually, it, it's very useful for devs, it's very useful for a lot of people. I'd say it's also actually very security focused as well, because if you can't you know, detect an intrusion, you can't get a handle on what's going on in your network unless you can see it. So all of our traffic's going through these proxies, and they're layer seven proxies. They understand this traffic, right? If this is HTTP or gRPC or Postgres or something, then Envoy is, is parsing it. It's getting the metadata out of it. It knows the HTTP host and path that we're, that we're looking at. So it parses all of these uh, protocols. It has a bunch of rich information available at them, about them. So it can send that off to a uh, telemetry server. So in this case, I'm showing Prometheus, right, for sort of time series metrics. Uh, and the way Istio does that is Istio has a, a pre-written pre blob of WASM um, because that, that extensibility is great. So Istio injects some WASM into Envoy. Um, and what that WASM does is it knows how to gather all of these uh, metrics, all of, the, all of these statistics out of Envoy. And it, this WASM knows how to talk to a Prometheus server. Other telemetry servers are available. Other forms of telemetry, like distributed tracing, like logs, are also available. So you can, it's, it's Prometheus by default, but you can configure, uh, you, can have, you can configure Istio to send its telemetry to any of these other types of servers, and all it'll do is it'll inject a different WASM blob into your Envoy. There used to be a separate component that did this back in, uh, back in version one of the talk. There was another Istio specific sort of online component that sat here. And they, Envoys would talk a proprietary protocol for that, and then it was the adapter point. But now, now the WASM extensibility exists, and WASM com compilers have got better, we can now have this WASM blob and push it directly into the Envoys and have them do it. So Istio is uh, ex extensible by WASM, right? Envoys extensible by WASM. That sounds like something we can have some fun with. So another thing we can do while we're at it is we can also inject our own plugins. If you write some code and you compile it to WASM, you can stick that in a CRD, apply it to Kubernetes, and Istio will pick it up and it'll push it into certain envoys for you as well. So you now have a really powerful, dynamic extension point you know, on the data plane, so you can make these arbitrary WASM blobs and you can push them in. And just to show how easy it is, in two pages, uh, and Rust isn't exactly the most, you know, the most slim language anyway, I've got a page of um, boilerplate, essentially, and then a page of code. It doesn't do a lot. It basically looks at the remote user header, and if it's there, if it's X remote user Matt, it'll, it'll add another header saying, hello, Matt. And if that header isn't there, it'll add a header saying, hello, world. Pretty simple, but, you know, if it's in, fits in a couple of pages, I can compile this to a tiny little bit of WASM, stick it into CRD, inject it, and then every request gets this hello, world, or hello, Matt header added to it. 
super, and obviously you can make network calls with this and you can log and you can do all kinds of powerful stuff. And I, I'm sad the syntax highlighting isn't there because that makes everything prettier. Okay. Are we ready to send this thing finally? Are we done? Not quite, because what if Eve, the eavesdropper, tries to listen in on what we're saying, right? So within, within this, we're within a network namespace. This is maybe fairly isolated. If you want to start listening to the traffic bouncing around in here, you're going to have to you know, pop something in here. But to listen to this, you just need to be on the network, right? And these, these things could be on the same host, they could be on different hosts, they could be in different regions. So this is, although it's probably in your VPC and it's in your Kubernetes overlay network, it's still kind of the wild west. So we, we do want to reduce the, the chance of this. So what's the easy way to do that? Well, we, we just do encryption on the wire, right? We stick it in an MTLS tunnel. So rather than the old days, my, you know, my ingress layer, my load balancer would terminate TLS and then everything else is plain text because it's my private network. We don't really subscribe to that model of security anymore, so we can do encryption on the wire. In order to do that encryption, we need a TLS certificate. We're actually doing mutual TLS, so we need a TLS certificate at both ends. So again, SDOD will mint those things, it'll, it'll make them, and it'll send them out to, to the envoys to use. You can replace the SDOD doing that with a whole Spire setup, uh, Venify. You can do whole great uh, big enterprise uh, PKI integrations if you want to. Um, you can talk to me after. So are we finally there yet? Not quite. There might be some policy. So is you know is this thing actually allowed to talk to that thing? We've we've worked out where it is. We've 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 got the observability in place. We've encrypted it. But we probably want to have like a zero trust architecture. Zero trust is, it's a, it's a buzzword. Lots of people say it means lots of things. My definition would be sort of these five points. So for, for zero trust, we need encryption in transit. Well, we've got it with the MTLS, with those certificates. We need authentication of workloads, so of the actual you know, processes, of the machines. We then need workload to workload authorization. So is service A allowed to talk to service, you know, is this actually service B? Is service A allowed to talk to service B? And then we need end user authentication. You know, who, who is this person who's calling me? Oh, it's Matt, he's logged in, cool. And then end user to resource authorization. So not can Matt talk to service B because you know, if service B is the orders service, of course I can talk to service B, of course I can talk to orders, but can I view my orders? Yes, in the database. Can I view Liz's orders in the database? No. So that's, that's who we need to authorize end users to. So I think these are the sort of five pillars of zero trust. And um, we've got the, oh, I have slightly the wrong slide in here. Um, we've already got the encryption in transit. And because we've done that with, by mutual TLS with two TLS certs, we've already got workload authentication because these certificates, you know, they have a, a, a common name for, for the, uh, the pod on either end. So we've got a strong identity, a strong cryptographic identity for both sides based on, the, based on trusting the identity service A, the identity service B, we can then do Authorization, so it's another custom resource, it's another uh, Istio configuration document to say A can talk to B, but not to C. And we can also do end user stuff as well. Uh, so you would you know, pass a, a JWT uh, at the edge and you would say, right, your logged in users can proceed or something. And if you get your services to forward the JOT, like they forward their uh, trace bands, then you can actually do end user authentication. It, again, it's not just something you terminate at the edge, you can do it at every hop. So, you know, it's, okay, it's, let's force this person through an OIDC flow, you know, single sign-on with Google. Okay, it's Matt, forward the jot. You know, has Matt got any business being here at service A at the, you know, my account page? Yes. Okay, let's show him his orders in a subframe. Has he got any business being at service B? Yes, he has, because this is the order service. But we have a jot that I trust that says that it's Matt, right? So where we talk to the database, we'll list Matt's orders, we won't list anybody else's. Uh, very quickly, we can do egos control on the way out. Uh, same kind of deal, but often you don't want your services to be able to talk to the internet at all, or, or you only want them, you know, we know that the order service uses time.com to know the time, but doesn't need to talk to weather.com to know the weather, so we can, we can lock that down. It's actually surprisingly useful um, to prevent, you know, sort of data exfiltration, to, to prevent people connecting to, to sort of C2 networks if they do manage to pop part of your infrastructure. Again, it's just zero trust. It's about shrinking that perimeter as much as possible, deny having policy, globally enforced policy that denies by default and opening certain exceptions. I really have run out of time, so the, I was going to talk about
um, the host-based topology, which uh, meshes like Cilium do. So essentially, it's an, it's an envoy per host share between all the services. And then the, uh, the new Istio topology, which they call ambient mesh, which is basically a secure overlay network with these Z-tunnel components, and then an envoy per trust domain. So an envoy per Kubernetes service account, basically an envoy per app. I won't even go into it. Both of these have big advantages in terms of resource usage. The trade-off is your security posture, is the fact that your TLS key material and certificates are held by uh, a single entity. You know, uh, uh, a lot of them for a lot of services are held by a single entity. That could be a confused deputy, um, especially using Envoy for this. You know, Envoy was always designed as a sidecar proxy. It doesn't have any internal notion of security. You know, it doesn't have any uh, um, sense of fair queuing between the requests and stuff. So it's possible to, to DOS things. And you don't have that policy enforcement point next to every app. And in fact, you know, in this case, you've got plain text here. So the guarantees of this network namespace of this private network are kind of broken because you have to do plain text here you end up in uh, the, Z, the Z tunnel per host, puts you into an MTLS tunnel. But, you know, so this bit is now plain text. And also this thing holds the certificates for a whole bunch of services that are not even in the same trust domain. Uh, so a lot of you know, sort of tenancy guarantees are gone. So we've got a couple of articles up about sort of opinions on this um, as, uh, as a company. It's, it's a trade-off is the short answer. But um, yeah, those are the two um, new topologies that have that have come along, and they all they all you know have their advantages. They all serve different purposes. I think I'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>